He's about 455 yards away. He's going to hit about a two iron, I think. This is the School of Motion podcast. Come for the MoGraph, stay for the puns. If you want to get jobs doing weird stuff, you got to start putting some weird stuff out there. You know, it's like everything just flowed from me putting weird stuff on YouTube that wasn't for commercial work. So every, I try every year to just to like block out a bunch of time just to do something new that was just fully what I want to challenge myself with to kind of break some new ground. And almost I think every single time I've kind of done that, it led to a, another, you know, leg of, of my career that was kind of based from it. So I think it's super important to just do what you want to do in the off time, even if you're busy with commercial stuff, just make some time and, and, and expand your horizons. I am so excited to share this episode with you. If I still lived in Massachusetts, I might even say I'm wicked excited. Today on the podcast, we have a guest with the weirdest reel I've ever seen. If you're into the bizarre, if you're into laughing at inappropriate things, if you're into gratuitous nudity, then you are really going to love Nick Denbor. Nick is an animator who lives in Toronto, works mostly by himself out of a home studio, and he has produced a few pieces of work that might be best described as infamous. He's done work for Conan O'Brien, including a series of supercuts that have made the rounds in the MoGraph world, but he's probably best known for a parody of The Shining that he and a buddy produced called, I kid you not, The Chickening. Rather than attempt to describe it here, I suggest pausing this podcast and watching it before you continue, just so you know what you're getting into here. I'll wait. All right. In this episode, Nick and I talk about his unique entry point into the professional world, how he landed a dream gig working for Team Coco, and how his short passion project landed him at the Sundance Film Festival and on the radar of gigantic brands and ad agencies. There is so much geekery and wisdom in this episode, and also a bit more cursing than we normally have, but hey, it is what it is. I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So let's get to it right after hearing from one of our amazing alumni. My name is Adam Bolin. I live in Springfield, Missouri, and I have taken the animation boot camp from School of Motion. I've gotten from this course an eye for detail uh, that I didn't have before. And I can also think through my movements a lot more. I was relying heavily on plugins like Ease and Wiz, and now I've learned the graft where if I wanted to move a certain way, I can make a move a certain way. Now I can really pay attention to every frame and be proud of it. I would recommend this to really anyone that wants to get more comfortable with the animation principles. It's going to help you in many ways, no matter what level you are. My name is Adam Bolin, and I'm a School of Motion graduate. Nick, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast, man. Thank you so much for taking time. Hey, thanks for having me. And just so I know and everybody else knows, how do we pronounce your last name? Den Boer. Den Boer. Okay. Because I, I saw when you booked the podcast, you booked it as like Nicolas with, I think, two A's. Yeah. And I thought that's a little Dutch sounding. So I thought maybe <laughs> Den, I, it's probably not Den Boer. Okay. So yeah, Den Boer. Pretty Got it. Dutch. Noted. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty darn Dutch. <laughs> I like my Hachelslach like to everybody else. Oh, you so, know your stuff. Yeah, I do. I sure do. All right. So let's, let's first of all, I want to dig into your background a little bit. Uh, anyone listening, if you're not familiar with Nick's work, we're going to link to it in the show notes. Um, and right before we started recording, I described Nick as Syriac's Canadian brother. Um, but it's very weird. And when I, when I watch it, like all I can think is I love this. This speaks to me. This is exactly what I want to be watching right now, but I cannot really put my finger on why I like it. It's just that bizarre and awesome. So where did this style of yours come from? Oh, that's a bit tough to kind of, you know, because it's two sentences or less, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how, you know, styles kind of evolve over years and years, but like, it really does go way back to like teenage days. Like in high school, I started out like taking old magazines and cutting them up and like kind of 
using multiples of the same magazine. So I would have extra material to stretch out people's arms and legs and faces and kind of did some cut and paste stuff to make these kind of mutant freaks when I was like super young. So I think that kind of like, you know, and now I see I'm doing that stuff with 3D models and buying these high, high res, high end scans of people. And I'm doing the same kind of things by stretching their heads and faces and arms and making these weird freaks out of things. So it's kind of always been there to tell you the truth. Are there any like, you know, because it's funny, I was trying to rack my brain to think of things that I'd seen in my childhood that were like this. And I couldn't really think of too many, but I mean, you know, there, there's like this bizarre quality to what you do. And and um, it reminds me of, of another artist, Albert Omos, who he, he kind of takes these very realistic humanoid 3D models and stretches them and has, you know, like naked, just like a, just a bunch of dicks flopping around, just all <laughs> kinds of crazy stuff. Wicked. Um, I gotta look him like, up. I've been seeing so much cool shit on uh, Instagram, like people doing Houdini stuff, which I haven't really dove into yet, but just all that crazy soft body mangling of people. Yeah. Like, and, and so <laughs> when you awesome. were growing up, I mean, were there like weird cartoons or movies or anything like that? I grew up of- like on a farm in the middle of rural Canada where we had like an aerial on our property and we could only watch cartoons like on Saturday morning and they were from like the 1960s. So <laughs> <laughs> I was in like Rocket Robin Hood and stuff. I didn't see Got it. much. I was Got out it. in the back 40 playing Got in the manure right. pile. Yeah. So, I guess, so I guess this was just a gift you were, you were born with this love of the bizarre. Um, okay, cool. So, so you said you were doing like collages and stuff like that and sort of, you know, photo bashing, I guess yeah. is what we'd call it now. Um, and, and did that sort of persist like all the way from teenage years up until your career or did, or was there a break in the middle? Yeah, there was a bit of a break. Like I was doing that collage stuff. I went to, uh, art school here at Ontario College of Art and Design for like a semester and a half in uh, Toronto. So I was like, I kind of wanted to get into like integrated media video stuff, but I already had like a, my dad's old digital camera, hi eight machine, you know, and a computer that could like not really do video, but barely. And I get to school and they were like, nah, you still got to do like two years of VHS before we let you go digital. And I was like, this is ridiculous. So I, <laughs> <laughs> I actually ended up dropping out just for just a bunch of reasons. I just thought it was kind of lame and I needed to make money. So I kind of stopped there, but I kept doing my collages and my 2d work for years years, but then I stopped and started a construction company and did that for like nine, 10 years. And just only at the tail end of that, I was kind of making videos again and or started to learn to make videos and learn after effects. And, uh, yeah, then kind of just took a hard turn from, you know, renovating and building additions for people <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> doing like <laughs> commercial <laughs> motion graphics. Right. To, uh, doing weird things with Stanley Kubrick. So yeah. where did the, so you, you mentioned like, you know, you, you went to school for sort of a mixed media ish kind of education. Where did the, the animation side come in? Like what made you think, ah, I should learn after effects? Honestly, it probably wasn't. And I, I dabbled a little bit just with friends doing some projects in early art school, but not really too much until later on. I was like, um, you know, I was managing a band called Run With The Kittens here in Toronto. And I was just constantly like we I bought this old school bus and we painted it black and put all these bedrooms in the back. We toured across Canada for a while. And uh, I was always just making videos of the band. So that kind of just like trickled into doing more and more, you know, weird stuff with the video footage. And then I st- then YouTube came around and uh, I started just, you know, I had early crappy capture cards with like a TV antenna with like recording television off on my computer. And I just, it was so like novel to have video footage from the airwaves on your computer back then. I would use that as my primary, like, you know, remix footage. And, uh, yeah, so it was kind of like early 2000s started messing with that. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of like, you know, taught myself from messing around and come and cooking up projects for my, me to do. That's really funny. I I can remember being in probably high school and convincing my parents to get me one of those like video capture cards out of a magazine or something, (laughs) you know, and it could capture like eight seconds at a time, 320 by 240 at 15 frames a second or something. And that was cutting edge. (laughs) 
I watched the Twin Towers get hit on my capture card, on my first capture card. I remember I just bought it, like, uh, and then all of a sudden Ooh. I'm like watching it like live on my computer. The Twin Towers going down. It was kind of crazy. Oh my god! Well, I assume you, you you probably won't be using that footage in a, in one of these weird remixes yeah. <laughs> anytime soon. No, I've so, gone HD now. I can't go oh, back. Exactly, exactly. 1080p or bust. So, uh, you know, your your newer stuff, um, and we're gonna get into that. Uh, is a lot more 3D and really just kind of just abstract, weird, creepy, awesome 3D. Uh, but a lot of the earlier stuff and the stuff that got you noticed um, was this sort of remixing of found footage. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I, I've been kind of reading some of your interviews uh, with media and stuff like that. And a, co- a few times you referenced this sort of remixing culture that the internet has kind of allowed to thrive. And it, you know, there's, there's YouTube channels like auto tune the news and bad lip reading. Uh, you've got artists like Syriac, you know, I'm a huge Syriac fanboy. And th- this, this medium of, you know, just infinite amounts of video that you can now play with is sort of a new thing. So I'm, I'm curious um, if you feel like the work you're doing is sort of born of this age, is this, or is this something that's been around for 50 years and I, I just didn't know about it? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess with with moving pictures, it's still fairly new. But I mean, people have been repurposing stuff for years. You know, whether it's a you know a, a urinal in an art gallery or whatever, you know, like kind of t- turning some you know otherwise non artistic object into a new piece of art isn't isn't a new thing. But I think mixing all this technology now is like, you know, we're not just remixing, uh, you know, a TV show or something like that. We're remixing a TV show, adding 3d models that someone else made. I I consider kind of like adding all this stock footage, uh, that's online into the mix of remix as well. You're, you're kind of just building on all these little puzzle pieces of, of artwork that everyone's made and using it to make something new. And it's just when, when you're mixing, you like doing an audio remix plus 3d modeling remix, plus a video edit to the music, plus a 2d, you know, after effects, visual effects thing, all in one project. It, there's so much going on there that it's it's beyond making something new out of it. Like you're just making this whole, you're making something new in like five different fields, you know, and that's really exciting to me. So it's, I think just the combination of all the different kinds of remix that can be in one piece is, is really exciting and new. Yeah, I love that you you referenced uh, Marcel Duchamp's uh, mm-hmm. urinal in a museum. And by the way, just for everyone listening, I had to Google it. I didn't know his name <laughs> off the top of my head. I could I could have let that go. I would have sounded really smart. Um, is there is there any like culture built around this? Are there websites you know that that you go to or other artists that you kind of follow that? Um, you know, like, I guess, is is there a place where there's a sort of a community of people doing this? I think there's a lot, like, there's lots of subreddits where people are, are messing with stuff, you know, like, everything from, like, the, the kind of deep fakes, you know, fake app kind of stuff that's been coming out lately, or, like, Photoshop battles is still, you know, kind of a remix thing. I used to, I used to post a lot, and it's actually where I kind of met Syriac and a bunch of dudes in England that, that do this stuff on uh, uh, Beta, B3TA, um, Dot com. It's like a cool, it's a cool site. Back in the day, I used to participate quite a bit, and they all, they always had like an image challenge every week where we'd mess with photos and whatnot. I think they're still they still kick that back into effect recently. So it was kind of a cool site for remix artists. A lot of great dudes on there. It's like Swede Mason does cool uh, audio remixes. Cassette Boy, I don't know if you heard of him. Happy Toast does wicked uh, gifts, and and Syriac posts there back in the day all the time too. So. There's oh, lots, of, cool. lots of cool. I'm definitely going to have to check that site out. I, I'm not familiar with, with beta, so uh, we'll definitely link to that in the show notes so everyone can check it out. Do you? So when you make this stuff, like, do you have, I don't know, like, have you developed a sense of when something's going to be funny? Like, for example, we're going to talk more about the chickening in a minute, uh, but, you know, you, you've you've taken footage from The Shining and you've obviously videotaped somebody else's mouth saying different words and you put the mouth on the actor's face and, but you make the mouth like just a little bit too big. And it's like (laughs) something about that, that just works. And it's hilarious. And I'm wondering, like, do you just have a gut instinct for that? Or is there some sort of 
is there some something you look at where you're like, okay, now it's funny, you know? Yeah, I guess it's uh, it's always a kind of a weird balance. Like sometimes you have an idea and you're trying to force it onto the footage, and sometimes you let the footage and assets you're working with uh, inspire the idea. You know, like sometimes you're just looking at something you've already got your puzzle pieces, and you're like, how is this going to go together? And you just start kind of messing with it until you get something you like. And then other times you have this idea and you're trying to make it happen, and you're scouring the internet to find the assets you need to make it work. But <laughs> so yeah. I think yeah part of it's just kind of for having an eye for what looks funny and part of it is being creative with what assets you're using i don't know it's a, it's a bit of a mix of everything but most of the time you're i'm going for something that looks visually striking and makes me laugh i guess you know if i'm doing a comedy yeah piece. some of the stuff that you've done i mean it kind of reminds me of the uncanny valley where if you made it if you made the body and the head, you know, that you're mashing together, if it fit too well, mm -hmm. it wouldn't really be that interesting. But if it's too off, it doesn't work either. There's this middle ground where it's just wonky enough. Yeah. That's why I love it's Octane okay. because it's like you get that photo reel render look, but you can warp everything else and it just makes this beautiful, you know, mix of, of surreal and real in harmony. Yeah. It's, it's my, my favorite jam right now is the whole C4D Octane workflow. And it makes you feel a very strange feeling when you see, you know, a very photorealistic head being, you know, shoved inside of a toilet or something with a hamburger fired at his face. Um, and which, by the way, is a real thing. And we'll link to that in the show notes. Let's talk about um, let's talk about your your big break, I guess. Um, so for a while. You actually got to work uh, on the Conan O'Brien show, which I think is the best of the late night shows. Uh, and I'm wondering if you could just tell the story. How did you get that gig? Yeah, that's kind of uh, every gig kind of like links back to some video I made somehow or another. Like some it's all been word of mouth. My whole career has been kind of like a linear flow from one job to the next kind of thing. And uh, I, so early on, I, th I think in like 2010, I took a break from uh, life here. I was kind of just wrapping my reno construction career and I moved down to Los Angeles for the winter. And I just set up my computer. I brought all my stuff down there and I made this like remix of uh, The View called Sex Tape. It's got like Barbara Walters, all the old View gang and a musical cut with all kinds of weird stuff motion tracked onto it. And that video really got some traction in the right places. It was on like Attack of the Show and a bunch of other, I think that's what it's called, but a bunch of other TV shows and whatnot. So, um, I'm, I'm kind of going back a few steps from Conan here, so bear with me. It's all good. We'll but get then, there. Uh, uh, this uh, guy, Aaron Simpson, who worked at Mondo Media, I'm sure you're familiar with them. They did yep. like Happy Tree Friends and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, they, you know, had had a crack at that first round of like YouTube funding where they were throwing millions of dollars around to make like, you know, content back in 2012 or something. So they yep. they saw that that video and hired me to do this kind of like news remix thing during the Mitt Romney election uh, with Obama. So I was doing like, I did 12 episodes every week. I just took the whole week of news and remixed it musically into a two minute piece, uh, every week kind of thing. So it was just this like on the fly, super fast production. Hopefully by Wednesday, you have enough material to jump in animation for Thursday, Friday, put out a video by Friday after <laughs> at the end of the day. Kind of wow. Thing. So is that kind of, that was kind of my intro into high speed, crazy pressure, putting something <laughs> out super fast. And then, uh, I, I remember I was on a, my buddy's sailboat here in Toronto and I just got an email that was like, uh, m John Wooden, the executive producer of team Coco just tapped me and was like, Hey, we're wondering if you'd want to pitch some stuff for, for the show. And I was like, Holy shit. So I, <laughs> I, and he had seen that and that news hit stuff I did that. That's uh, sorry. I didn't mention that was the, uh, web series I made for Mondo was called news hit or new shit, depending how you see the app. Very nice. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, somebody had sent John Wooden the, uh, um, my stuff and he, you know, tapped me. So I, I went home that night and set up my green screen. I had seen this Brad Pitt Chanel ad where he's like saying all this pretentious crap. So I, <laughs> I you know, <laughs> stripped down, <laughs> took my shirt off and then uh, shot myself on green screen. And uh, my body is not as fit as Brad Pitt's, obviously. And uh, <laughs> therein, therein <laughs> lied the comedy. Uh, so I, uh, well, you know, was fondling my nipples and whatnot. Stuck my body on Brad Pitt's head that evening. Sent the clip over to... to to John at Conan, he brought his laptop over to Conan's desk, showed it to him, and they aired it that night. 
And I was like, holy shit, that's pretty cool. Wow. So I remember just like turning on my TV and I'm like, wow, I made that like this morning or last night <laughs> and it's on TV now. And uh, that just started this whole thing. About, I just started doing piece work for them, you know, just pitching videos as I made them. And I was I started getting a pretty high batting average. I was getting stuff on every week, if not every few days. And then that turned into a salary gig for a few years, just like, you know, me sitting in Toronto and shooting over video clips whenever I made them. And I had this crazy back door onto the show where where John would just take my take his laptop over to Conan, show him stuff, and it would I would kind of circumvent the the writer's room, the production staff over there, and whatever else. So it was a bit of a and, and eventually I would work with the head writer and I would pitch him stuff rather than that crazy backdoor main line onto television. But right. it was pretty wild just because like honestly some days I would be I would f- be scouring the news for whatever and like uh, I always tell this story but like the craziest one was probably the ones that happened like same day and there's one of justin bieber where he was in court and wearing a jail smock and he was just looking like a bratty jerk kind of so i had this bed sheet that was the same color as his jail smock when he was arrested (laughs) so i I like saw that at seriously like 10 a.m or something it was super early in the morning and i are relatively early in the morning and i went into my bedroom took off the bed sheet i cut it up with some scissors and literally duct taped together this jail smock it like looked good enough for camera kind of thing right went downstairs shot it on my green screen put it on my computer copped it it was like you know it's not the greatest comp job in the world but i did it in like an hour and a half or something like that because i had to get it in by one o'clock for rehearsal and then you know, I had time for one or two rounds of revisions quick. I, I printed some American money and lit it on fire. So Bieber looks like he doesn't care about the fines he's getting, burns the money, throws it in the air, gives the judge right. the finger. And then it aired that same day. So, you know, it's the kind of thing where we beat all the other late night guys to a joke about that. Even, you know, it's almost like once you've got something in the bag that gets a million views, uh, is anyone else going to do it the next day? So it's kind of like a race. It's a weird competitive race in a way you know the late night game yeah that's incredible man so would would the team over there you know because you mentioned you kind of circumvented the the writer's room and i've never worked on a on a show like that but i imagine that for most of the people working on the show there's probably more than one person between you and conan o'brien that, that has to approve a joke before it gets oh sure and that was that was only right? that was only in the early days like for the first few yeah. videos that that was kind of going on <laughs> and then then uh, you know after the first whatever few months or something then i i got kind of th- to the point where i would just uh send clips directly to the head writer th- uh, with oh, john as well like john would help and we, we would kind of craft uh you know we would kind of write a mock-up of what conan's uh yeah, dialogue would be to set up the joke and what have you. And then, you know, so I would say, but the thing is I'm in Canada in Toronto, uh, East coast time. So I had three hours before any of them would even get to work. And a lot of time I would have a rough video sketched out before anyone was even there. Whereas if you're a writer on the t- on at the show, you have to pitch your ideas for the morning to the head writer. The ideas that get okayed if they need to have video done for them are then you know, sent off to go shoot with a team and then they they would get edited by another editor. If there's VFX, another guy would do VFX. And all of a sudden you've got like all these people slowing down the process where I could just like literally go downstairs, shoot something on green screen, throw it on my computer, get it done, kick it out there and upload it in no time, you know? So it's a way faster process. I mean, my studio is not as good. I don't have a crazy, as crazy of a green screen setup and what have you, but that kind of a production pipeline is so much better for fast production with way less red tape, way less politics. And if a late night show actually harnessed that and had like 20 people that had multi, you know, talents that could kick out videos and instead of this committee style thing, I think it would be huge. Yeah. I was going to ask you about this because you really are a one man band. I mean, you're not just, you know, looking for the footage making an edit and doing the visual effects. You're also writing music for this, sure, yeah. literally composing songs and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, I, it's interesting because I think there's actually a lot of artists in this industry that can do all of those things, but we sort of don't give ourselves permission to do all of them because you can feel like, a, you know, what's the the expression? Uh, Jack of all trades, master of none, right? Sure, um, yeah, and, you can spread yourself then. Yeah, exactly. But then on the other hand, it's allowed you to 
to be more nimble than the competition on, on other late night shows. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and so I was going to ask you, I mean, do, do you think that this style of work, this remix kind of, you know, not completely seamlessly composited look, do, does that scale up? Like, could you scale it to a bigger team or does it need to be a singular vision? I did a project for KFC in January, uh, through Wine and Kennedy, uh, dudes over there in Portland are amazing. And they, uh, hooked me up with this job. It was like, we had two weeks to do this, like, you know, half hour of content. <laughs> it was insane. Oh it was this God. whole <laughs> psychedelic, um, uh, meditation video for chicken pot pies. That was supposed to be like a, uh, infomercial slot kind of thing, a 10 minute thing with a whole bunch of like extra backup videos. So it was like, we had two weeks to do this. So I just hired everyone I knew who could help out kind of thing on a, on a whim. And uh, actually I had, I had David, uh, area who is, uh, you know, octane Jesus. He's been on your podcast before he, he did some yeah, space he's a stuff. Great dude. He's, he's very talented. Oh, he's dude. amazing. Yeah. So he did some space stuff for me. My pal Davey force, who is my co-conspirator in the, the chickening. He flew down to here to help out. So it was kind of like I was producing it and kind of like making it all happen, but I also was shooting it and, <laughs> you know, editing it and, uh, and doing, you know, a good chunk of the effects. So it was a bit crazy, but it was scalable and having that, the people, you know, helping me and me knowing every, how to do every step of the project and being able to guide everyone efficiently, I think was huge. But my whole career, I've been avoiding starting a company where I'm running like 10 people because I know a lot of people who used to love doing their art and now they run companies and they're not really having fun anymore. And I don't want to be that guy. I like doing it. I like getting my hands dirty. I like the art of it. And if I can make good cash, just doing projects that I can handle one at a time, I'm going to keep doing that. But when projects come up and it's, it's good money and I can scale up and hire my friends even better. Right. So exactly. And, and I mean, that, it sounds like you, you know, you probably had to have a crash course in being a creative director in order to, to, to pull that off. Oh, sure. Um, yeah. So it probably gave you a bunch of perspective too, on what, what you like and don't like. Totally. Can we talk about, um, your home studio setup? Because, you know, I was going to ask you, I mean, I, I assumed that working for Conan O'Brien, you'd have to move to the U S move to the West coast, but you said that they let you work remotely, which is incredible. Uh, so what kind of setup do you have that allows you to shoot footage on a green screen and, you know, screen hours and hours of news and then <laughs> do all the editing, compositing and compose music. Like what, what is your, your office My look setup? Like? So I bought, I bought this, like uh, it's kind of like a mini warehouse. It's like a coach house. that's like hundred years old in behind a uh, residential subdivision. And, um, so it's like a couple thousand square feet. The main floor is like, you know, my garage where I got all my tools and my, my car stuff, my man stuff. Nice. <laughs> and my, I've got a jam space down there, a bunch of instruments and stuff. And, uh, so it's kind of just a, you know, workshop slash uh, musical playroom. And then, uh, upstairs I've got, uh, two workstations, uh, well, and one defunct workstation, but <laughs> two workstations. One is my main, you know beast machine and the other is kind of a backup render slave now so i don't know if we want to talk gear but i've got a i've got a big giant expensive box with three uh, 1080 ti's in it yeah pile of ssds uh, i've got a uh, nas with like 64 terabytes i've got a uh, my second machine has two uh, pascal uh, titan axes so i've got five video cards for rendering and then, uh, yeah, my music stuff, I've got, you know, a bunch of music gear here too. So I've kind of just flipped between video and music. I'm still waiting for that piece of software. That's like a video editing software that also does music and supports VSTs, you know, like a lot of remix artists use uh, Sony Vegas, but at last I checked, it didn't have like VST support. And I'm like a huge Cubase guy with like a bazillion VST instruments. And I'm like, Yep. I hate the fact that I got to jump between software to do all this stuff. You know, I'm done like blindly editing and bouncing between the two. And I just wish like Adobe or somebody would make a piece of software that just was super music heavy and video proficient, you know? Yeah. I, Adobe Den Boer yeah. CC. That's what it'll be. <laughs> but there's a lot of remix <laughs> artists that could really benefit from that. You know, like I think it's, it would be huge. Yeah, that, it, it's interesting because I, you know, I didn't really think about that. I have, I have actually worked on a few projects that are sort of remixy, you know, where I remember a, 
years ago, I had to uh, work on a spot where we took, and it's interesting because you did something similar. We had to take footage from Star Trek The Next Generation and cut it up and make a song out of it for a promo for like the show being syndicated on TBS or something like that. And it was an enormous pain in the ass because you, you know, in your video editing program, you can sort of edit the dialogue so it sounds musical, but you can't also compose in the same app. And yeah, and so I get it what you're saying. I mean, that, that would be really, really useful. And then w- let's talk about the the shooting part because, you you know, oh, yeah. you star in a lot of these things or at least your nipples. I do. used to do yeah. a lot more. I've kind of <laughs> right, my right, dancing right. career is, uh, you know, dwindling. But, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I wasn't going to ask you where you got the G string that showed up in the Sarah Palin hot tub video. But so, so I mean, what's your setup for shooting that? I mean, do you have like a, a full psych wall with a red camera, or, you know? I used to downstairs, I had a full psych wall built and then I'm like, I shoot so seldomly, like it's, you know, it's not like I shoot every day. So it was just taking up tons of space. <laughs> and I had yeah. like a, you know, I, my ceilings aren't too high down there. So I had it like going curved up the floor and up the ceiling so I could kind of shoot up and down. And then I had the whole ceiling green too. So it was like just, you know, the whole area. Yeah. It was actually a pretty sick setup for the small space I had. But now I just, uh, when I need it, I set up my uh, giant, I got a giant fabric one and I just set that up when I need it. And I've got a bunch of Kinos and LED lights and I've got, I shoot on Ursa Mini. I just bought that about a year ago. Nice. And I love it actually. It's a great camera, especially for green screen stuff. Uh, it's super crisp and i've got a pile i had a whole bunch of lenses from my 5d before so i uh, i'm using all ef lenses and uh, i mean i love i love your setup because you know it, it i mean at this point i'm sure you've upgraded over the years and as you've had some success and some bigger jobs you can afford to get get a nicer camera and things like that but really your setup you know i mean if all in 15 20 000 bucks i mean it, it's really just like an order of magnitude cheaper than it would have been. Sure. Like, like for the, for the camera, you mean? Yeah. It, for everything, you know, to be able to, I mean, you know, to do the kind of 3d you're, you're doing now, sure, yeah. you can render everything photo realistically at 4k using your five graphics cards, but you used to need a gigantic render farm, <laughs> you know, to have any hope of doing it. Yeah. Like I look, I look back at, you know, staring at buckets on uh, using a standard cinema 4d renderer and i don't even know why people would even get into cinema anymore and starting out i remember just like it's so frustrating watching that happen when you've got any kind of a complexity in your scene it's it would just you know it would feel like i had my arms tied behind my back and was trying to do something you know it's 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 brutal so octane really yeah. changed the game for me that's why i've kind of dove in full blast on uh, on cinema yeah, I've heard that from a lot of people who who use Octane. So let's get back to to uh, the Conan O'Brien sure. show. So w- kind of walk us through like what was the process of you know like a typical process of getting a you know maybe a brief from them or or did that even happen? Like what would it actually entail? You know, like some rarely like uh, once in a while I would get. Uh, you know, a writer would come up to me with their idea and want me to execute it. But that was pretty rare. Like most of the time it was a fishing expedition where I'm cycling my news sites, the vortex of every news site and every major news organization's YouTube channel and or trying to rip their video off their websites or whatever, you know, just like finding something that happened that day that sparked an idea. So and watching tons of shitty TV, like I would have be watching everything from like The View to like Good Morning. Morning America is watching those, you know, DJs on Good Morning America and just wanting to, you know, not have to watch it yeah. <laughs> the whole time. But like, you know, that's kind of you, you find kind of the, the gem sometimes on some weird, you know, thing that no one else noticed. And you make a joke out of it, and put a magnifying glass uh, on it and it can be really funny. So you kind of look for those diamonds in the rough, but also you got to hit the big stuff. Like I would pull all nighters every time there was an Oscars or an Emmys or whatever. Right. <laughs> wait and if anything sparked try and kick out a video so it was ready the next morning so you've got that kind of crazy work schedule where if something clicks you gotta like you know go for it so the timing wasn't a normal schedule by any means yeah um but but yeah lots of like watching really crappy media like that was after like you know after three years of that stuff i kind of moved on and it was like uh 
I, I found I was like addicted to watching all this crap. I was still watching it when I wasn't even <laughs> pitching for the show. And I'm like, why am I still watching? Yeah. So I'm like, had to like, you know, unplug my television and get away from it. Cause it's just like, I don't know. It was overload. Right. But you're, you're tuned in. Like, you know, everything that's going on in the world. <laughs> and It's kind of like, it's crazy. So it took a little while to wean off of that again. That's hilarious. So I, I was going to ask you about this because, you know, I assume that to do what you were doing, you had to watch hours and hours and hours of, of bad TV and news and this and that. Sure. And, you know, I was my first job in the industry was I was an assistant editor. And so I would have to go through 40 hours of footage and log it accurately for the oh, yeah. or something like that. And my mind would wander and I'd get bored and I'd find myself 30 minutes later like, whoa, I just blacked out. Now I have to go back and do it again. Like, how would you remain focused? Because I'm assuming that that's not the fun part of the process for you. Yeah, a lot of that stuff. But you know what? When you get in the zone, it's kind of like uh, it can, you know, you kind of lose track of uh, uh, of it. If, if you're watching and like I, I feel for dudes who are like editors on reality shows where you've got 16 roaming cameras following around talent that doesn't have a script, you know, and yeah. like, it's like, what are you, what are you watching? How do you even get through that stuff? Like I did a, I did a project that was kind of like that once. And it's just like, you're, you're scrolling through footage of like, you know, somebody chasing a dog down an alley for like 20 minutes and nothing happens. And you're just like, kill myself. But when you're doing something creative, it kind of takes some brain power while editing. Like I, for, for Conan, I did this pretty successful bit that was, had like 13 parts or something. That was where I took uh, jeopardy episodes and edited the edited, uh, Alex Trebek's words kind of seamlessly so that he said crazy shit. Hilarious. Like just, they're you so know. funny. <laughs> so that was insane. So this, the, the premiere project I had cooking for that was like nuts. So I, I had, I think something like 30 or 40 episodes all chopped up into different sections. I had like, you know, subject, predicate, nouns, verbs, adjectives, whatever, like all these different little phrases. And then I had individual words, I had individual animals, I had the names of celebrities, everything was in a separate timeline, all like chopped up so I could kind of mix and match my sentences from there. So you're, though, that took hours and hours every time to find stuff that would kind of phonetically work and also just to organize it all and come up with something that was also really funny. So that was kind of an editing uh, nightmare, but it was fun at the time because it's like a challenge, you know? So yeah. that when it's challenging like that and you're hunting and it's kind of an aggressive <laughs> thing, you know, like you're really trying to find stuff and then I don't really get bored. It's just kind of like, yeah, zone in and yeah, I, I was just thinking that the show notes for this episode are going to be just comedy gold. Everybody listening, <laughs> you have to go watch the Jeopardy things. Well, the coolest thing about that was like, because after I had done like a bunch of them, like I think, yeah, 10 or 11 of them or something, they actually got Alex Trebek on the show. So the last one was Alex. And I remember watching that on TV and I was like, I can't believe this came to this. Because like, you know, the, the whole bit was that Conan would say uh, that Alex Trebek's losing his mind. He's gone crazy and he's saying all this crazy shit so then alex came on the show and then they they were i actually uh edited a thing of conan looking crazy for that episode so alex had a clip to bring and you know it was uh this whole back and forth but it turned out awesome and it was super funny so that was kind of a cool closure to that whole series that's amazing dude you yeah you must have just been like pinching yourself like is this really <laughs> is hey, this really like, happening he's right a now? canadian <laughs> he's a canadian celebrity alex uh, trebek he's a legend yeah excellent <laughs> as is drake i understand so oh yeah uh, yeah so let's talk about the the technical side of this a little bit so um <laughs> you know in case you're listening to this and you haven't yet seen any of nick's work um you know there's a there was a, a clip that went around I remember seeing it when it came out. It was a Conan supercut, I think it was called. And it was basically sort of a, a best of, you know, what had happened on the Conan O'Brien show in the past year. But Nick created it. So it's just bizarre. And this it's this like weird romp through a year of Conan O'Brien. And one of the gags that you did in it was you kind of took footage of guests sitting on the couch next to Conan. Mm -hmm. But you would swap Jennifer Lawrence's face onto, you know, like a Snoop Dogg's body or something like that, right? And the what struck me when I watched it um, was that the quality of the compositing, I mean, you know, it's not going to fool anyone like at the feature film level, but it's pretty darn good. And oh, a lot thanks. of the gags you do don't work unless the compositing 
is pretty spot on and, and the tracking has to be good and you have to match the colors, which is super tricky. Well, with the Conan stuff, it's like that was a pretty controlled environment where the lighting right. the same every episode, which helped a lot. But but yeah, thanks. That was a, that was also a bit of a time crunch on that. Like I, I did three of those uh, Conan super cuts. Yeah. And the one you're referring to is the, the last one that's season four. <laughs> And that one, I did it start to finish the entire thing in five weeks. And it was like crazy because I'm surfing through an entire season of a hundred plus episodes that are like 40 minutes each, you know? So you're trying to find, and I'm mostly scooping through the highlights, but you also have all of Conan's intros and monologues and blah, blah, blah. So it's a crazy, you know, first week of trying to pull all the clips and then trying to figure out how to piece it all together and then write the music and then do the VFX. It was like, the, the, I can't even fully remember my process on that one, but that, that's probably one of the favorite videos I've ever done. Cause it's, you know, it's another one of those where you have free reign to do whatever you want. It, I got to kind of use all my different tricks and all the different software and do a musical cut. So th those are kind of the, the jobs I'm most proud of when I can, you know, fully use all, all the skills and bring them all into one space, you know? Yeah. So where did you develop the technical chops that you have? Because, you know, th there are things that you're doing that are not just intuitive to, to most artists, you know, uh, matching. I, I'm, I'm sure on the Conan O'Brien set, the lighting's always kind of the same. So that makes it a little bit easier. But when you're taking news clips and matching them to something you shot, you know, on your green screen, like next to your computer, you know, like how did you learn to like match lighting and match grain and match sharpness and then, you know, color correct it so it feels the same? Like, how did you learn all that? Uh, just from doing it. I mean, if you look at my early YouTube stuff, it's terrible. Like you can see, I didn't know that stuff. And <laughs> just from doing, <laughs> doing like doing it for years and years, you kind of like, you know, you learn were, all. You were bad at it long enough to get good at it. Oh yeah. I, I was tracking party hats on dudes on TV and SD and like the party hats all jittery and it sucks. <laughs> yeah. So what, so what tools were you using on the Conan show? Was it just sort of the, the basics, like just after effects or did you have any, any extra plugins or anything you were using? Um, yeah, but it's almost all after effects, tell you the truth. There's a few things I started getting into cinema in those years. So like there's some stuff like, you know, uh, we, we took like when Ben Affleck was going to be Batman, I remember I bought like a turbo squid model of the, of Batman's mask. And I like, 3D tracked it onto Ben Affleck's head in in like crappy movies like Gigli and all like his worst <laughs> to awesome. make it look like he was you know he was Batman in these terrible clips. So that I started doing a bit of Cinema 4D stuff and trying to do 3D tracking by hand before the 3D tracker was there. So I was doing it frame by frame. So that stuff didn't look great either at the time. But uh, yeah, I started kind of doing a bit of 3D then, but mostly After Effects. And I, I think I started using Mocha back then too. So that kind of made rotoscoping a lot easier, especially with the supercuts where there's tons of roto. I, I, I got into Mocha and uh, it's changed my life forever. <laughs> Made of everything course. faster. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, all right. So let's move on to uh, what, you know, was probably the the piece that you're most famous for, I guess. Uh, the chickening. And I have to say that uh, yesterday I shared the chickening uh, in the School of Motion Slack and caused uh, an uproar. <laughs> really. A lot of people hadn't seen it. They didn't know it existed and nice. probably derailed the rest of their day. Um, so for anyone who hasn't seen the chickening, uh, I'll, I'll let you tell the story. But basically, it's a parody of The Shining. It's kind of this five minute trailer esque video, uh, a reimagining of The Shining uh, if instead of a hotel, it was like a fast food themed amusement park. Uh, <laughs> so could you just, I, when I, I, you know, I have my questions for you in front of me and all I wrote down was how, why? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually like I, I made that, that short film with uh, my pal Davey force, who's uh, an amazing animator and uh, wicked dude. So he was like, I first met him way back in the day. I saw his name on the credits for Tim and Eric and uh, he did the opening title sequences and some animation for Tim and Eric back in the day. And I'm, I, so I looked him up on YouTube and I was like, oh, this guy, he, he did all this crazy remix stuff as well back in the day. That was like, he was in a band called the TV Sheriff where they were doing, he had like a MIDI controller keytar that he was controlling video using a program called VJAM and he Whoa. had video projection behind him while he had like a DJ and an, a video ape like this guy in a pink ape costume and they they, they like open for Beck and Devo they had a, uh, some success 
guess, uh, in I think early 2000s. But yeah, really cool kind of live remix band. And I'm like, who the hell is this guy? So I reached out to him and I was on a trip to Los Angeles. I went, went for lunch with him and I was like, dude, we got to team up and do like you know, like a wicked, crazy, end all be all, you know, movie remix kind of thing. Like just take, that was our idea. We kind of cooked up. And then like seven years later, we, we actually did it and, and made this, uh, both had some time off and we were, uh, um, I was still working for Conan at the time. And through Conan's production company, we were going to uh, Warner brothers to pitch, um, this TV show where we take classic films, reimagine them as, you know, something completely different and weird and package it as a, as a, you know, 22 minute TV show. So that was, this was actually just a pitch piece for that show concept. So I was kind of hoping to get like actually a full pilot done and Davey and I, I flew Davey up here to Toronto. We just watched, the uh, shining like a bunch of times and uh, jammed out on it and cooked up this stupid idea and then we just committed and i remember even being like is this a good idea like this is gonna be a lot of work why are we doing this right, right. And we just it like look like a no. lot of work <laughs> and then once you know you're a couple weeks into it you're like all right this is happening and we just went for it spend spent a couple months on it and then we actually had more like 10 to 12 minutes of stuff done but it really wasn't reading like you know it needed we needed to fill a lot of gaps to fill the story out and so I ended up cutting it down to five minutes and uh, making it read more like a trailer. And it was still just kind of a pitch piece where we're like, okay, this is just a cool proof of concept. And my pal Kenny uh, Hotz, who's in it, he's a guy in the bathroom scene, uh, naked, the you naked know. Guy. Okay, and, I was going to yeah. ask you who that was. <laughs> so he's, he's actually a pretty big celebrity here in Canada. He did a TV show called uh, Kenny versus Spenny, which is uh, pretty hilarious. I worked on it way back in the day. And he was also, he was a writer on South Park for a couple episodes. Like, he's a pretty funny dude. Oh, so cool. he, I was super pissed at him because he leaked the trailer out that I made the proof of concept out to like 80 people. He emailed it out, you know, and I was just like, you fucking asshole. How'd you do it? Why'd you do this? You know, it's like, now it's out there. Everyone's got a link and I had to like make a private, <laughs> but I totally like ate my hat because he sent it to all the right people. Like he sent it to, uh, this guy, Colin Geddes, who was the, um, one of the curators at the uh, Toronto international film festival. And he saw it like, and was like, holy shit, what is this? And he put it into the Midnight Madness program at, at TIFF, which is the best kind of like most rowdy, crazy uh, film program at the Toronto International Film Festival. And they never show short films at this thing. It's always features. So he tucked it in uh, before a feature one of those nights. And then it just, all the right people saw it from there. And then it got into Sundance and it went in, like literally, I still get asked by film festivals to show it. It's I, We're over 70 film festivals that this thing has been in all over the world. So it kind of started this crazy ride and it, I went to tons of the, any festival they would fly me out to, I went to. So I traveled for like the, you know, 2015 into 2016 to all these film festivals, met all kinds of people. It was a great time. And uh, yeah, and then uh, we, we actually launched it online while it was at Sundance because we're like, you know, when you're in, when you get a film into Sundance, you get this giant press list of like a bazillion emails. So Davey and I sat in our hotel room and emailed everyone individually like or in groups of whatever media organization they were in and we blasted it out and like i think by the time i left uh, utah it was like already at a million views or something like that it was it was crazy wow so we did we did a crazy blitz while we were at the festival to try and hype it while we were at the festival you know like we just planned it to kind of get out there and we got like you know 40 pieces of of uh, uh 40 articles written about the about it while we were there it was, <laughs> it was pretty wild. Did you get to sit in the audience as they were watching it? Yeah, totally. And what was that like? That must've been crazy. Yeah, it was, it's, it's, it's interesting to see how some jokes hit in some audiences and some fall flat in some audiences. It's, it's crazy and it's different for every town and it's weird. I guess, you know, laughter is kind of contagious. So if you have a, a, somebody who laughs early on, it can kind of spread, but it's, it's, it's always interesting to me how different it is from audience to audience with some jokes, uh, would play better with some crowds than others. And, but generally it's always well received and people are like, what am I watching? You know? <laughs> right. I, mean, I, I remember seeing it for the first time. And again, it was just one of those I don't know why I like this so much, but it just, <laughs> it's brilliant in a, in a strange way. So let's talk a little bit about the production on it. I mean, 
was it the same kind of process that you were doing, um, you know, for Conan or did you try new techniques, like upgrade anything? Um, I think the biggest thing was kind of writing around the script. So we actually took little sequences, broke it down in little chunks. Like there's a, there's a greater story we were going towards where there's a Scatman Crothers was actually an, uh, com- owned a competing, like, you know, burger chain kind of thing. That was like, <laughs> and he was going to steal the secret sauce. And there's a whole nother subplot that we, you know, you can't even figure out from the, unless we actually made it a half hour and, and added all the action sequences we needed. But right. You know, the um, the big thing was just taking the sequences we were going to use and writing around the script. So we had, you know, the characters we were leaving in and the characters we were adding in. And it, that's kind of a remix in itself where you're cutting and pasting dialogue from the original script and then inserting new dialogue. So the whole writing process is, is a remix in itself, which is super fun. And that, I think that's where a lot of the comedy is, where you're bouncing new lines off of the, the original. That's where that's super funny. Like if we just replaced everyone in the film, I don't think it would have nearly the, the, the comedic impact. Right. Right. So I I love little Danny with, you know, a a beard (laughs) and (laughs) a double chin. So can you talk about how, like, you know, when I saw it for the first time, I, the first thing I thought was that you just tracked a mustache onto the actor's face. No, that was like full. Like I just, I blended the lower half of his whole face and jaw onto Danny. So I shot him with like, uh, you know, all the right angles and <laughs> tracked it on there. And then there's a lot of puppet tooling going on there too, like to on his, uh, uh, whatchamacallit sideburns. Right. So they right. weren't lining up and all that subtle rotation just throws it off right away. So there's a lot of frame by frame kind of puppet tooling there and it could be better still, but it's like, I got it to a point where I was happy. So it, uh, it worked out. Yeah. But it's, got every, every character at some point, their eyes go in two different directions. I mean, were, were you, <laughs> I mean, would you just sort of do all everything at once or would you like work on a shot and be like, you know what, this would work better if Shelly Duvall's left eye was spinning in circles while the right eye was doing something different, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like just shot by shot. Just do a shot till it's done and move on to the next one kind of thing. Unless, you know, if, unless I cook something up. Uh, and I want to throw something in the background and for continuity's sake, you got to go back and put it in all the other se- sequences yeah, you yeah. just did. But, but yeah, it's pretty, pretty linear for the most part. Just tackle a sequence, move on to the next. Like we were, it wasn't like, you know, there was tons of time to like sit and finesse things. It's just like go with it. Well, the, the whole idea was to add a bazillion Easter eggs, you know, it's the kind of thing I think I get this a lot about my work is just, you can watch it over and over again and notice new things all the time. And I, I love kind of loading stuff up with tons of stuff to get that rewatchability, you know, like it's, I think it's a good thing for it's for the recipe of a viral video to kind of make it so that it's rewatchable so that it's not like you can just watch it once and have taken it all in, you know? Yeah, that's really good advice. And, you know, hearing your story, uh, there's a lot of parallels with other artists that have been on this podcast who do you know, a short film, a personal project, not really thinking much will come of it. And then, you know, the universe takes over and, and decides, nope, actually this is going to be a big deal for you. So (laughs) what, what happened once, you know, so, I mean, and, and what was smart was you capitalized on it. You recognized, all right, we got into Sundance, let's market this thing, let's get it out there. And, and so once, you know, I'm assuming there was like a period where everything kind of peaked and then the hype died down but well, now, really, what you're kind of a known quantity, right? So, like, what did you? What happened next? Well, uh, just one little side note: the crappy thing that happened, which I completely regret, is not blurring out uh, Kenny's mangina on the on the bathroom scene on YouTube because he yep. tucked his wiener between his legs, and I yep. thought, ah, there's no genitalia; we can get away with this. So, once it hit a million views. Uh, it got flagged on YouTube and the momentum just stopped dead in its tracks. Oh. And I was like, oh, damn, because of that nudity thing. And I'm like, shit, if I just had mosaic that, it would have just kept going. Because then once they flag it like that, it's no longer on any of the, you know, sidebar on YouTube where it's like related videos and stuff like that. So it really just, it was the, the, the graph curve of views literally is going like on a 60 degree angle upwards for like months. And then it just, boom, stops and goes flat. So it's like the power of getting flagged can totally ruin your momentum there. But it's still, you know, slowly trickled up. It's at one point something million now. But 
definitely took the wind out of the sails, but it didn't matter because all the right people saw it. It's been in all these film festivals. One of the biggest things, which is great, is the the dudes at Wyden and Kennedy uh, in Portland saw it and were like, whoa, we got to hire this guy. They contacted me shortly after they saw it. And uh, I started doing some Old Spice videos for those dudes. And that was so much fun because they just gave me tons of leash on that to go crazy hog wild. And I, I made this like remix called a horrifying mutant something abomination i don't even remember what it's called <laughs> but it's uh it's like they gave me five or six spots that they had done and they're like hey we you know want you just to remix this into something new so it was the same kind of thing it was a musical cut i did some 3d some 2d it's kind of like blurred the lines where where the original spots ended and where mine began you know i kind of tried to seamlessly blend into it and it, it worked out pretty well so that was a super fun spot and led into a good relationship with those dudes so it kind of sparked a little bit of a an advertising tear that i've been on for a couple of years now well that's great man and old spice is just such a perfect fit as brand yes. for for and your that, style those dudes you know? kind of spread out into into kfc recently so that doing that kfc for like the same team you can kind of see that they're <laughs> they're doing the wacky stuff for the with the colonel nowadays so yeah it's been kind I'm, of fun I'm glad. To, i feel like for a while you know there there were these like sort of in the advertising world semi-famous commercials probably 15 years ago for quiznos uh, and I don't know if they have that in Canada. It's like a subway knock, yeah, yeah. like a sandwich chain, right? Sure. And, and, it was these, and the commercial was like <laughs> these very strange, bizarre looking, like hand puppet squirrel looking things. Oh, wow. I've never seen song. that. Yeah. It's really, it's very, you love it. <laughs> it's very strange. Uh, cool. and, and for a while it was cool to do really weird, strange advertising like that. And then that kind of wasn't cool. And I'm glad to see that like <laughs> there are still, you know, creatives out there that, that are doing that because it's just so much fun. Well, I think there's uh, a lot of fun to be had in the advertising world. And the same thing that I was talking about before with, with Conan being, being the, the one man show or having, being able to produce a whole piece with a very small crew, at least is super beneficial to advertising jobs too, because like where a big studio is going to charge like, you know, a quarter million or half a million to do a shoot and do all kinds of post on like some 30 second spot is like, if, if one guy can do all that, you can still make really good money and undercut <laughs> in the big studios. And that's kind of where, where I'm poised is like, you know, Hey, if you have, you know, five figures and want to do something, we can do something awesome with octane and make it look wicked and hire some great artists. And, you know, like now it's kind of like, I, I feel like, you know, taking table scraps from like the mill or something like that is a way you can still make a lot of money and not have to, you know, overcharge the client and the clients happy because they can produce lots of short videos for a decent price and still get good quality. But it's kind of, I think that's the way things are going and, you know, and maybe it's bad to be sort of undercutting, but if you can do uh, if you can do a piece from start to finish and it's, it's good, why not? Right. Well, I also think that you, you're definitely right. And I think that just the fact that you can have all of the gear, you know, in your, in your house basically, and can just do this in literally in 24 hours, turn around the kind of stuff you can. I mean, that's, that's not going away. And so companies like the mill and, and the psyops and the bucks of the world, you know, they're kind of coping with that. And that's just, well, the you know, mill also you know, like you know, those, the mill does crazy next level stuff. I can course. do obviously too, but I think the mill also does a lot of jobs that lots of freelancers could totally do. So it's like, there's a bit of a balance there. Like I saw the mill at, at FITC that do a presentation that was like, holy shit. Like they had live, live HDRI recording and live tracking of a car they built that it was like they could pre vis a car commercial in oh, yeah. real time and stuff. It was like, they're doing crazy stuff, but you know, some uh, like ad agencies will go to the mill to do some super simple thing and pay way too much money. I, I imagine. <laughs> oh, that's definitely still happening. But I think, you know, what's, what I like about your work is that to me, it seems, and may, maybe you disagree. I'm actually curious what you think, but to me, it feels like if, you went to the mill and, and by the way, I have to say, I love the mill. I mean, yeah, me too. Of the mill, they're brilliant. Right. But I feel like if you tried to do the chickening at the mill, it would be so much harder because the more people you add, even if they're all brilliant, creative, you know, team oriented people, it makes it harder to have a very unique singular vision. It's possible, of course. Right. But I mean, just look at Hollywood movies where you have some brilliant director who still manages to make a movie that isn't great 
And it's because when you filter an idea through a giant amount of people, it just tends to get a little, you know, the, yeah, the edges sure. get shaved down a little bit. Um, and so it, it just kind of, it seems like what you're doing lends itself to the one man band better than say, you know, a car commercial, right? Yeah, I guess. I, it's, I guess it's kind of all who's in charge. I, I could imagine like if, if you had the right team, uh, any you know, the right team could do it. I think a lot of it though is like when you have a team, you need to show them what you want them to do sort of. Like if you're just like looking for that creative spark to just happen when right. you bring a team together, it's kind of rare that it'll be a unified vision. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So if you're, yeah, I, I don't know. It just really, it's hard to say, but I, I imagine, you know, the right team could totally do the chickening, but there's a lot of sensibilities there. That's why I think, you know, people like to hire me for what I do because it is that kind of like vision from start to finish where I, I look at like that Conan supercut and it's like, I, I have trouble explaining my workflow to that because I'm jumping around from six different things. And, and then, you know, you start with a beat and then that, and then you bring it into premiere and then you've got a cool little riff going with some vocal and then that sparks a visual idea. So then you go on that tangent for a while and then you're like, Oh, that would, you know, be wicked if that transitioned from that moon into that uh, other background. And then it just, it's really fluid and it, and you're being inspired by what you're working on to do the next thing It's a very kind of autonomous, uh, workflow and i don't think you can just be like hey here's a team go nuts and work, work autonomously and just build on each other and sometimes that works i mean i kind of did that with the kfc thing with the uh we had a we had a plan for the the meditation video but it was a bit of like hey go nuts on some space scene octane jesus rock it out and he did he did a thing and it was awesome yeah. When you give your artists uh, leeway to do something that they're awesome at, then you kind of know what you're going to get a little bit. But then it's still kind of up to the the person who is uh, who's you know directing it all to make that vision happen. So I think if if some place like the mill or something had had a director that had the vision, they could get get and, and knew their artist capabilities, they could totally orchestrate something like the chickening. But yeah, well, I hope I hope someday somebody gets a chance to find out, and I hope you do get that uh, you get that pilot, you know, and, and get <laughs> a TV show because that would be outstanding. I want to ask you, you know, when you kind of got your start. Um, you know, I, like just talking about the Conan O'Brien stuff, it sounds like you just had tons of leeway and you were basically pitching things and saying, if you like this, put it on TV. If you don't, you won't put it on TV. But that now you're working with, you know, brands that, you know, have brand standards and, and have to, you know, worry about offending people a little bit more and stuff like that. <laughs> and you're working with ad agencies who are filled with creative people that probably have their own opinions. So is it different doing what you're doing for a client? You know, like how, how does that change your method or the way you think about it? Um, it's definitely different. Sometimes, sometimes it's not, like I said, with the old spice dudes, those like the wine and Kennedy guys are like, awesome and so like i've done projects for them where it's storyboarded and scripted and i just go shoot it and edit it and do the effects and it's you know reflecting what they gave me on the creative they've got a great creative team over there but then other times they just give full leeway for me to you know do a treatment and go nuts on something so though and both are fun in their own ways like sometimes it's a cool challenge to do it do it both ways but you know where i get to go hog wild and do whatever i want is always more fun for sure right but you know, then you can sometimes get clients too, who just all of a sudden they, they're hiring you and they think you're just like a magic paintbrush. You can do whatever they want. And yes, it is exciting. You can do, you can do anything. Like you can take any imagery and do what, whatever. But if there, if every single creative decision is stripped from you in the, in the process, then it's no fun, you know? So it's a sliding scale of how much, how much input you have as to how happy I am doing the project a lot of the time, you know, but if it's a cool idea and someone cooked up something awesome and then it's super fun to work on cause it's, you know, you're working towards a good end product. And so it's, yeah, it's a, it's a total varying scale. But that said, working with clients, I've had so many, I have probably feature films worth of stuff that I've made that has never seen the light of day. Lots of, lots of things. I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> there is, there, is, there's a hard drive somewhere with a bunch of just normal looking even stuff just, on it that you've done. Even just Conan. I've got so much stuff. And some of it's the best stuff I ever made for them that, that never made the show. And, uh, also, uh, like I did, yeah, tons of ad stuff. I, like, yeah, there's, there's like, I wouldn't say tons, but like there's enough that it's like, you know, to the point where literally everything past 
uh, like clients approved of concepts, approved of stills, approved of everything. And then it's like one person sees the video and is like, whoa, that's too extreme. And sometimes it's like not even like I had a, I had a video I made. I won't say who the client was, but it was like a turkey and a bunch of little numbers on uh, dancing on a turkey and shooting it with a flamethrower cooking this turkey while it was floating in a river <laughs> that's awesome and they're like nah the, the vegans are going to be really upset about that and and it got canned and i'm just like what <laughs> it's a turkey it's a christmas <laughs> video for you know some company oh my goodness i'm like wow so sometimes it's super tame stuff i'm sure lots of people like that's just kind of par for the course everyone i talk to in the industry kind of has a client who you know can something because it's the wrong color who knows why there's all kinds of dumb reasons but for me there's also like you know it's sometimes extreme content but <laughs> you know. do i mean okay so when i look at your work i can i could look at the chickening for example which is just crazy, bizarre, off the wall. But in it, I can recognize all of your design skills, your animation skills, your compositing and technical chops, storytelling chops. And so that would, you know, if I was going to hire someone to do, let's say, a, a, I don't know, a 30 second spot that doesn't have to be really weird. I just need someone who is good at that. I would know that Nick Denborg can do it. But I'm, I'm assuming clients mostly come to you for your style, right? So do you ever get asked to just do like an explainer video for a bank? Like, do you have, do you ever do projects <laughs> that don't look weird and crazy like your um, stuff? Well, it's, I've, you know, I told my friend years ago, uh, who was a wedding photographer, he was upset that he was just getting wedding photography jobs all the time but that's all he was kind of putting out in the world yep and i'm like well if you want to get jobs doing weird stuff you got to start putting some weird stuff out there you know and make oh. a new site or do something so i always like i track everything back to like you know like all this advertising stuff came from the chickening because i made that all the previous stuff came from my early remixes i had so like those tv early tv remixes i was doing that made it onto like boing boing back in the day and then like ken block from dc shoes saw it and then hired me to make a a remix of his jim Connor videos like everything just flowed from me putting weird stuff on youtube that wasn't for commercial work so every, i try every year to just to like block out a bunch of time just to do something new that was just fully what I want to challenge myself with to kind of break some new ground. And almost, I think every single time I've kind of done that, it led to a, another, you know, leg of, of my career that was kind of based from it. So I think it's super important to just do what you want to do in the off time, even if you're busy with commercial stuff, just make some time and, and, and expand your horizons and don't just let your commercial work expand your horizons because it's limited to what people are paying you to do based on what you've already done most of the time. Yeah. So, That's I think advice that uh, a lot of, a lot of people in the industry give, I, 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 I yeah. generally say do the work you want to get paid for before you're getting paid to do it. And I totally. think that, you know, you're, you're, another example like that that really does work actually so that said to answer your question it's like yeah people generally hire me to do something comedy based like i really do kind of specialize in vfx comedy i guess but uh, it's found a lot of different applications like a lot of times there's so many like tv shows that want like a promo video where i could like a lot of it is funneling down content in the remix style that i was doing for all those years it's like you can take a whole tv show like conan whittle it down to one video i've done lots of like other tv shows where i've done promos for them that way done advertising uh, remixed advertising you know remix uh even film film vfx so this kind of style can lend itself to advertising film tv uh just you know web memes whatever you know i've done some stuff for uh, super deluxe like, that are pumping out the daily stuff and live streams and and even virtual reality you know i kind of uh, gone into the 360 space a uh, little bit as well so i think there's there's just so many applications for that same style that um you know there's not i'm not really limited but i generally like a bank is not going to come to me for a how-to video in general yeah, for the most thank part. god right <laughs> yeah well you know <laughs> if they did if they did i would definitely switch to that bank that would be, be enough for me <laughs> yeah but uh awesome. but yeah, i think it's definitely a little bit of uh you know people hiring you to put to do what you've already made for the most part 
Let's talk about the uh, the evolution of of Nick. And for, before we get there, your website is uh, smearballs.com. Mm-hmm. I'm just uh, curious, is there a story behind smearballs? Not really. My buddy Aaron uh, Zimmerman and I, like early on YouTube days when we were doing those, uh, you know, TV remixes, uh, he's a good friend of mine from art school. And we were just kind of messing around making videos. And I think we were roommates at the time. And I, like, because my parents are Dutch, like your, you know, bicep, like your muscles or like your spear in your spear balls, you would say, if you're like flexing your muscles, spear balling. So he misheard me and he's like, what smear balls one time. And I was just like, yeah, smear balls. And then we just, I don't know, we called our, our stupid remix thing <laughs> smear balls early on. On. and i just kind of took it from there went solo years later and just kept kept the the site going it was just a dumb blog at first of just posting baloney but uh yeah which is kind of like, like a band name you know it. it's like now it's, sure. it's 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 like you too it means nothing until all of a sudden it means something right? <laughs> <laughs> but there's something you know about it that with the remix thing that it just makes sense you know you're kind of smearing things you're you're altering them yeah, and there are balls sometimes in your work. Exactly, so yes. it's accurate. Also, <laughs> so anyway, I wanted to talk about the the more recent stuff you've done, including a video that I just saw. Um, I think it was released pretty recently for Dead Mouse, um, and it's very different looking than your earlier stuff. It's not as much remixing footage as adding things to footage, and specifically like really realistic but strange 3D things. So where did this new sort of look come from? Has it been something you've wanted to try and this was a good opportunity or I guess like it's, else? yeah, I guess it's just kind of the evolution of tracking. Like, you know, starting out with just tracking dumb party hats and glasses on people in 2D <laughs> to, you know, eventually doing full 3D camera solves and stuff. And I think just because of, again, because of Octane and cinema getting into that stuff, I just started experimenting more with that. And, uh, I did like a little thing. It's on my Instagram of, of the front of my studio where there's just all kinds of weird. There's some dude with a burger head and a bunch of like dogs and strange things kind of <laughs> in front of my place. I'll tracked in. I just did a quick test when I, when I first bought my Ursa, I just wanted to do a little camera test. So I, I busted that out. And, uh, I think I was at, must've been just before or after I forget what, um, I had been over at uh, Dead Mouse's place, at Joel's place, for doing uh, doing some live visuals because uh, I did. I worked on his like live show. Doing you know, he's got this crazy 3D cube uh, LED screen transformer that he, he sits in while he uh, while he plays, and so he he invited me to do some content for that. And uh, so shortly after, I I like sent him that clip I made, and I said, "Dude, we should do this of your mansion, like just you know." <laughs> go shoot a bunch of plates, make a crazy video. We were Skyping about it and he was like, yeah, come on over. So like the next week I just went over with my camera and, uh, and just shot a bunch of just empty rooms and whatever, like with really no, no strong idea of what I was going to do other than just a pool party, you know? Cause I, the first time I went to his house, there was like all these people there, like having this like whole pool party and all like, and I'm like, well, where's Joel? You know? And they're like, he's inside and he's literally in like a dark room on his computer while all these people are like partying at his house. <laughs> I'm like, that's just kind of a funny image to me. Like this com- computer nerd dude and, and his, uh, you know, com- on his computer while there's like a party going on. So I thought, you know, let's kind of make that into a video. So the video, and again, we'll link to it in the show notes, but you know, it's basically like, I, I guess, drone footage or a steady camera. Or yeah. So Joel, like. Joel is actually the drone pilot on that. He's got like, you know, one of those crazy DJI inspires, I think it's called those, you know, expensive. When you drones. say Joel, you're talking about dead mouth. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Gotcha. So he's, you know, he's a drone hobbyist and he's actually a pretty good drone pilot. Cause I've since bought like a, a, a phantom and it's like, you know, takes some skill to get those smooth shots but he did that uh shot going up the driveway on uh, the on the intro of that uh, video and it's pretty i stabilized it a bit but it was like pretty solid going in so he shot that and a whole bunch of other drone sh- footage i didn't even use but um i tried to you know get as much of that in that, that I could and then fill the rest with crazy da- dancing. Yeah. And I, I noticed, uh, he was wearing a cinema 4d shirt in the video, yeah. which, was, which was, I think was pretty cool. So, Actually, I think the guys from Brograph gave him that, uh, when, when they were working on, uh, on some visuals as well. Oh, that's funny. That's awesome. But it's okay. So anyway, so back to the video. So you tracked in, just just a weird array of stuff all over this guy's house. And there's, you know, there's like very realistic, 
I guess, realistic looking people, but like they're clearly <laughs> not real because their heads are distorted and sure, yeah. their eyes are pointed in different directions. Um, but I mean the, like the tracking and, and these models, I don't know where you got them and, and it, it almost looks like mocap or something. I mean, it looks like a very, very technical execution here, totally different from what you've done in the <laughs> past. So like, again, like, you know, are you like some technical wizard, like at learning stuff or are there now, is it just now easy to, or easier to do that kind of it's stuff? It's just easier. I cheat like crazy. I use Mixamo yeah. for most of that stuff, you know, the magic of Mixamo. But I, I hack into these Mixamo rigs quite a bit and like, you know, I'll, I'll throw like, uh, you know, uh, Signal, the plugin for uh, Cinema. Yep. I was throwing a lot because the whole song's at like 128 BPM. So like those dancing gummy characters, I just like deleted all the keyframes on the spine and I put IK um, chains on the spine and then just put a signal rotation at that BPM on the, on the like hips. So yep. it's just like shaking those things around, giving them that jelly look on, on their upper body. And so I just kind of mess with Mixamo rigs a lot for those just to make them more ridiculous and <laughs> over the top. So that's like a big uh, part of my toolbox lately. Cause it's, it's kind of easy and, and fun, but the scans, most of them, a lot of them came from uh, site 1024, the 3d scan store, mm -hmm. uh, 1024.info. I think it is like spelled T E N 24.info. And they're, they have like amazing, super high poly, scans that are like 8k textures and amazing so i was like messing with those but it was a bit of a trick to get those into mixamo i had to decimate them to like quarter million polys or so so they but they're still pretty high res and then i was doing a lot of frankensteining like cutting the heads off of those models and putting different heads that i had or warped and uh kind of stitching them together and uh doing like you know i don't know all, all kinds of weird <laughs> things to alter these bodies and a lot some of the bodies are just from adobe fuse that i just stuck a high-res head onto it just a fuse body so that the you know so it was easier to animate i, and, I uh, love that that's how you did it because you know a lot of uh maybe 3d purists you know that the, they're all about like mo you know proper modeling oh and, sure and and proper shaders and, and matching the lighting perfectly and this and that and all of that is super duper important for certain applications but sure. when you're just making cool stuff however you get it done you get it done and, and you're clearly very resourceful uh, well i did i shot hdris in every single space of that uh of that shoot. Like I, I shot three different HDRIs up the driveway for that shot. I think I ended up only using two of them though, but then, uh, you know, cause the lighting kind of changes. So I did use those, mix them with octane suns to kind of like get a better shadow. And every room of his house, I shot an HDRI with a, uh, I used a Rico Theta. And so I had every time of day, every, every place I shot, I had a, an accompanying HDRI. So that made the lighting kind of lock in nicely. And then I used those HDRIs as backgrounds, like every close up where the camera's panning all crazy, like when the skeletons are dancing in the foyer or the guy with all the eyeballs in that room, I just blurred out, you know, cause the Rico Theta is only like 5k or something like that. So you don't get that detail if it's in focus. So I just kind of blurred it out, did a fake doff thing and, and just pan the camera around and it made for a good backgrounds. So. That's, that's amazing, man. Well, we'll definitely link to the video in the show notes. It's, it's hysterical. I, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't know much about dead mouse, but I have to applaud him for like letting you just do your thing for his <laughs> music video. It's amazing. Um, and before we, uh, before we started the interview, you mentioned you might be doing, uh, more of this kind of thing. So the last question I'll ask you, Nick is, you know, what are you working on now? Like you have any cool projects we should be on the lookout for? Yeah, I'm doing right now. I'm doing VFX for a show on the WWE network and uh it's a uh, kind of a weird comedy show uh with uh starring edge and christian i don't know if you know those the tag team wrestlers are canadian guys so i'm helping out with a bit of vfx on that nice and uh then i've got another dead mouse video supposed to be done before the end of the year that i'm still trying to fit into my schedule here and uh possibly some more ad gigs it's just it's never ending i'm always kind of booked a few months ahead and struggling to not piss off people people by pushing my projects over top of each other. But you know, it's, uh, it's, it's good to be busy. I can't complain. And in 2019, I'm hoping to take some time off to do another personal project as mentioned before. So that's uh, kind of uh, on the horizon. I need to do that next year. Like I mentioned to Nick, the show notes for this episode are basically a comedic goldmine. 
Check them out, but maybe don't do that if you have urgent things to do because you will be sent down a hilarious rabbit hole. Check out Nick's work at smearballs.com if you want the full Nick Denbor experience. I want to thank Nick for coming on and being so candid about his career and his process, and I really hope that we get to see a lot more from him soon. And thank you, as always, for listening. I hope you dug this one. Smell you later. <laughs>